Hi folks, how you doing? It's James JT at the Movies and welcome back to Debriefing 007. We are back for episode number 13 where we're going to take a look at 1983's Octopussy. <laughs> So, as I said, in 1983, Octopussy came out, and Roger Moore once again returned as James Bond Agent 007, though he was initially hesitant to do so, having stated that For Your Eyes Only was to be his last James Bond film. The producers even went as far as to screen test other actors, including James Brolin, for the role. However, when it was announced that Sean Connery would be returning in a rival 007 franchise, based on the Kevin McClory rights to the story of Thunderball, the producers begged and insisted that Sir Roger come back as they couldn't bear the thought of launching a new James Bond against the legend that was Sir Sean Connery. Roger Moore being the good sport that he was of course agreed to come back and for me personally this is one of my favourite Roger Moore adventures. I would actually rank this in my top five all time James Bond films. I really really love this film. I have a really great time with it every time that I watch it which actually didn't always used to be the case when I was a kid and a teenager. This was one of the ones that I really didn't care for all that much and then I watched it one night and probably about 18 or 19 years old and I don't know something just clicked for me and ever since then I've always loved it um, and I'd say that I think this is my favourite Roger Moore adventure. Um, very very close behind A View to a Kill which I love for different reasons because that is a poor film but uh, on a subjective level I absolutely adore that film. But that's next time's episode. So. We'll do a bit of a plot recap. Now, there's quite a lot going on in this one. We start this one after the usual gun barrel opening and before the pre-title sequence. Bond's on a mission in a Caribbean nation that's not really um, not named for, you know, sort of not wanting to offend anybody, I suppose, more than anything else. And he's there basically to try and blow up uh, an enemy airbase, posing as one of the guards. Of course, it goes wrong, but with the help from uh, Bianca... Um, of course it goes wrong, but with a little bit of help from his fellow agent, Bianca, he's able to escape the guards and manages to detonate the bomb that blows up the base and then escapes in a really, really cool little jet um, and has a silly one-liner before we go into the title sequence where he pulls up the jet at a little petrol station and goes, fill her up, please. And... I, I just love it. I really, really love that. Uh, we then get the title song um, sang by Rita Coolidge, All Time High. So, obviously for this one, the film's called Octopussy, they weren't really going to be able to write a song called Octopussy, or at least have that featured in the lyrics anywhere. I mean, for me, if I'd have written it, I would have written, you know, All Time High, but then called it Octopussy, in brackets, All Time High, because the song actually didn't chart at all. Um, and I think one of the reasons being... Um, well, I think one of the main reasons, actually, is, is because... It didn't land very well and sort of the easy listening sort of adult contemporary sort of thing wasn't really what people were going for with their, with their Bond themes. Um, personally, I love it. Um, and I really love that they send it up in TED, if anybody's seen that. The Seth MacFarlane film, Mark Wahlberg sings it with um, Nora Jones and it's horrendously bad but hilarious. But anyway, yeah, so, um, so there's that there. But also, all time high, they didn't sort of link it into the film anywhere. I think the only reference to it was on the film's sort of initial posters. It was called James Bond's All Time High. So to jump into the main plot of the film, we, we come out of the main title sequence and we see a circus clown running away from a circus being chased by two twins who are knife throwers, Mishka and Grishka, who are sort of the henchmen of this film, if you like. Um, the clown is looking very, very scared um, and he's constantly looking over his shoulder and, and you know trying to evade these two blokes, throwing the knives at him. Really tense, brilliant music from John Barry as well. One of the pair of assassins manages to get the clown with a knife, but just as he falls into the river, the clown with his dying energy manages to get to the British Embassy and collapses through a door in quite a dramatic scene, um, revealing that he's got a Fabergé egg. So that Fabergé egg is then taken back to MI6 in London and 007 is brought in uh, to basically find out what's going on. There's, a, there's an expert that's brought in, Jim Fanning, and basically M, who's this time played by Robert Brown. This is the first time M's appeared since Bernard Lee's passing. And Robert Brown, who had previously appeared as Admiral Hargreaves in The Spy Who Loved Me, has now taken on the role. It's widely accepted in the Bond community that Hargreaves was actually promoted to M and given the, the rank and the code name of M, and that that is the same character rather than it being a different actor playing Bernard Lee's character. 
Whilst discussing the egg with Jim Fanning, M, and the Minister of Defence, it's revealed to Bond that the egg is actually a near-perfect forgery. The real egg itself is actually due to be sold at Sotheby's auction house. So Bond and Jim Fanning go to find out what's going on, as clearly there is a link between the two. At the auction house, Bond obviously causes a, causes a scene in only a way that Roger Moore's James Bond can by outbidding this film's villain, Kamal Khan, played by Louis Jordan. He ends up having him pay over the odds for it and in a sleight of hand move switches the fake egg for the real egg so that the British government are now in possession of the real egg. Bond realises that there's more to this whole elaborate plan and M says that Bond must follow Kamal Khan back to India where the majority of this film's plot takes place. Now before we jump into the sort of the rest of the plot and where everything all sort of links together, we then jump over to the USSR and we're introduced to the film's secondary villain, or sort of probably joint probably a joint sort of co-lead villain if you like actually, and that is General Orlov played by Stephen Burkov. Now he's one of General Gogol's sort of um you know, peers, if you like, and he doesn't like the fact that the West and the Russians are starting to have warming relations and talking about nuclear disarmament, and Olov believes that in entering such talks with the West and the Allied nations uh, would put Russia at a sort of a weak military standpoint, and believes that the West should disarm, but Russia should keep all of their nuclear missiles. General Gogol and the rest of the Russian council shut him down, um, but Orlov doesn't want anything to do with that. And it's at that point that we then learn that he's sort of teamed up with Kamal Khan, and they have this really sort of intricate smuggling plan going on to basically finance their own sort of elite sort of movement. Bond arrives in India and quickly meets up with Head of Station I there, which is VJ, played by VJ Armitage, who was a tennis pro back in the early 80s. And this was really sort of his first starring role in an action film, having just been a sports personality before, and really was, I suppose, more of a bit of a celebrity cameo. Though I do actually really find him a compelling sort of uh, sidekick to Bond if you like, and much as the way um, is with, with all the John Glenn uh, Bond films of the 1980s, the sidekick doesn't make it out alive, and actually VJ's death a bit later on in the film is actually really quite a sort of, you know, tugs on the old heartstrings sort of a moment, and you, you feel it, and you can you can sense the upset from Bond that he's, he's lost a pal, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that anyway. Bond heads to the hotel slash casino where he's staying, which also just happens to be the hotel slash casino where Kamal Khan is staying. Uh, and he's there with Gobinda, uh, who is another one of the henchmen in the film. And he's also there with Magda, who is one of the um, the girls, the ladies that works for Octopussy, the film's leading lady, played by Maud Adams. And again, we, we meet her in a little while. Bond sees Kamal Khan sort of scamming a you know a, a wealthy Brit out of some money in a, in a fixed game of backgammon. Um, and when the wealthy Brit decides that he can't take any more, um, you know, any more losing, um, Bond realising the trick takes on and introduces himself and reveals that he's the one with the real egg and basically inserts himself into the story. Kamal Khan doesn't realise straight away who James Bond is and that he's working for the British Secret Service, but realising that he has the real egg and that he's come all the way to India just to insert himself into this little caper, realises that he's up to no good. Bond, of course, wins the game of backgammon after playing Kamal Khan at his own game. Kamal writes him a cheque for the winnings, which is cashed, and then Bond and VJ make a make their break for it in a in a tuk tuk taxi. It's at that point that Gobinda gives chase in a in a really really fun scene that looks like it could be something straight out of Raiders of the Lost Ark or Temple of Doom. And again, I think that's something that was an intentional choice by the filmmakers because as has been done with a lot of the Bond films of the seventies and the eighties, in particular the Roger Moore era, they take a lot of inspiration um, and sort of pay homage, if you will, to popular films of the day. Um, and I and I really think that this film's setting and the fact that there's jewels and Treasures involved, and just just some of the scenes, you know, later on with you know sort of um, you know Indian palaces and things like that. Something right out of Temple of Doom, isn't it? And then the, the the chase through the streets is really reminiscent of the the chase scene, sort of in in the, the sort of the early part of Raiders. But anyway, um, 
Bond and VJ manage to escape Gubinda uh, and head to India's Q branch where we meet Q. Um, and then for the next sort of part of the film, Q, VJ, and Bond are sort of like a bit of a bit of a trio of allies. Really, they're they're sort of doing everything all together. And I love it when Q's out in the field. I know some people in the Bond fandom really don't care for that, but I absolutely adore Q, uh, especially Desmond Llewellyn's portrayal of Q. And when he gets to come out on the missions, you know, this license to kill. Um, I, absolutely love it just get more of that all all day long more of that I'm, I'm i'm here for that bond later on while he's dining at the hotel meets up again with magda who sort of comes and sort of starts flirting with him and starts having dinner with him of course bond sees right through it and knows that she's after the egg q's managed to actually put a tracking device in the fabergé egg because they're anticipating it to be stolen again and they want to understand the journey that the egg's going to go on and find out what the bigger picture is here with this case after spending the night together, Magda flees Bond's hotel room in a really sort of dramatic style where she sort of flips over the balcony and uses a sari to abseil down the down the building. Of course, she's stolen the egg. Kamal Khan then whisks her into a car and they sort of share a bit of a, you know, sort of a, a nod and a wink, you've won this round sort of thing. Before Bond can do anything, in a moment that's fairly reminiscent of Goldfinger, Gobinda knocks Bond out unconscious. He then wakes up at Kamal Khan's palace. So at Kamal Khan's palace, Bond, Kamal and Magda all sit down to dinner. Uh, and again in another scene that I find really reminiscent of Temple of Doom. Um, although I'm not actually sure Temple of Doom had come out. It just feels sort of like cut from the same cloth if you like. It's when they sit down to dinner and Bond is served a stuffed sheep's head uh, with the eyes and everything still intact. And you know we, we get the witty one-liner from Bond. You know, funny, I lose my appetite when I'm being stared at. And Bond and Kamal Khan have a bit of a, a bit of an interaction, but nothing's really sort of given away. Um, Bond is then taken back to his room, which is essentially a glorified cell. With a gadget from Q, he manages to break through some bars and escape. There's then a scene which is really silly, and one of the scenes that gets the most sort of criticism from fans of the Bond franchise, and why a lot of people don't like it. And do you know what, Bond fans, I will give you this one. The, the scene where Bond is escaping through the jungle and Kamal and his men are sort of doing the, the sort of the hunting for him, you know, the uh, most dangerous game sort of type rip off. It starts great. And then there's the, the tiger that jumps out at Bond and Bond goes, sit. No, stupid. And then to top it off, he's swinging from rope to rope through the trees and they insert the classic Tarzan. I'm not going to do the noise, but you all know the noise that Tarzan makes when he when he swings from rope to rope. And it's just daft. And then when he finally does escape, because there are moments of genuine peril in this scene. And I think it could have been played a lot more seriously and had a lot more sort of, you know, sort of weight to the scene if they'd have taken those silly moments out but then when Bond finally does manage to escape with a, a tour boat that's actually just going down the river and you can see him actually sort of almost looking genuinely panicked he gets aboard the boat now the end of the scene should have been the boat just sailing away and Bond and the villain sort of locking eyes but no some silly tourist pipes up oh are, are, are you with our group no madam I'm with the economy tour Again, just really take you out of the out of the moment, and it's one of my few gripes with this film. Now, I, I do know that this film, folks, is not perfect. It is not a gritty spy thriller at all, and you know, it's it's not a Casino Royale. It's not a License to Kill. It's not a Golden Eye. It's not a Doctor No or a From Russia with Love. But I, I do just love the camp, silly cheesiness of this film, and I think it's just perfect for the phrase that gets used a lot the calvin dyson phrase a sunday afternoon bond film you know it's the one that goes on like say on a sunday afternoon on a bank holiday you can watch it at christmas you know it's that sort of a that sort of a film it's an easy watching film to jump back into the plot because i keep going off on little tangents in this one this is probably going to be the longest debriefing episode ever uh, but yeah, to jump back into the plot, Bond then later decides that he's going to go and investigate Octopussy's floating palace, which is something that's been referenced and sort of alluded to throughout the film, to find out what's going on, as he now understands, because of a tattoo that Magda has that he discovered when they spent the night together, that Octopussy is involved in this caper between Kamal Khan and General Orlov as well. And he needs to understand why. So using an alligator submarine and another blooming daft moment he sort of swims sails whatever uh over to octopussy's palace uh, and infiltrates um and then sort of manages to 
he swims over to Octopussy's Palace and manages to infiltrate the, the base, getting into her room. It's at that point that the, the writers chose to do something quite sort of, I, I thought was, was a nice little sort of nod and a wink to Fleming, because by this point the films hadn't really been adapting the books sort of faithfully at all. Um, in fact, For Your Eyes Only was closer to the short story of Risico. Uh, Moonraker obviously bears no resemblance to the novel apart from the fact that Hugo Drax and James Bond are in it uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, the only thing that's in that uh, that's in the novel is Jaws, believe it or not, um, and again The Man With The Golden Gun, in fact the last probably semi-faithful adaptation was Live and Let Die, uh, but by this point the producers were just using the titles and elements of the stories but going off largely on their, their own sort of adventures, but yeah, to bring that back to the point that I was going to make Bond then learns from Octopussy that she is the daughter of Major Smythe, who was a British war criminal. Now, for anybody who's read the Fleming short story of Octopussy, basically this film serves as a, a sequel to that because the, the story um, in, the, in the short story that Fleming wrote is Bond being sent out after this war criminal after it's revealed that he's killed his, um, his, his hiking guide in the mountains and, and basically run away and lived off Nazi gold. So Bond so basically, basically Bond sent after him with a court martial, and upon hearing the guy's tale of woe, decides that he'll give him twenty four hours to clean up his affairs and essentially give him the the honourable way out of of taking his own life rather than facing a, a court martial. So in this story, Octopussy is the the daughter of General Smythe or Major Smythe, sorry, in that story. In the in the novel, Octopussy is just an octopus that is in the bay um, where the beach sort of where where Smythe is living, and it's the octopus that ultimately kills him, um, which is very Fleming esque, isn't it? Uh, but in this, Octopussy is the pet name that the guy gives his daughter. She then sort of takes on the octopussy as a, a sort of a, a mantle and a brand, and initially started out life as a as a smuggler, but she then reveals to Bond that while she does still partake in smuggling, uh, and she's obviously earning commission on this whole sort of jewel deal that Kamal and all of have got going on that she has actually diversified into sort of like circuses and you know basically legitimate enterprises as well and she offers sort of sanctuary and a career for for young ladies in the world trying to find their path as well so that's the octopus's sort of army of ladies which are sort of in the film and, and obviously play a part in the third act Kamal then turns up and trying to warn Octopussy that James Bond's got involved and that he needs to be eliminated. But Octopussy then reveals that Bond is there um, and Bond sort of in a bit of a tongue-in-cheek you know, way sort of saying he's a friend of the family basically sort of says, well, joke's on you, you know, she likes me and there's, there's no way you can do about it. Kamal's obviously not having any of that and hires some local goons to try and kill them but insists that Octopussy not be harmed. Of course, they completely make a, a hash job of that uh, and when they break into Octopussy's palace, um, nearly kill Octopussy as well. Bond manages to subdue them um, but leaving Octopussy thinking that he's drowned in the river, he makes his way back to the mainland to meet up with Q and give them the update on the status. The same goons that broke into Octopussy's palace to kill Bond and Octopussy had also killed VJ on the way and that was the scene that I was talking about earlier where there feels like there's some real weight to VJ's death even though we don't really see much of it. Bond seems really really genuinely upset um, more so even than he did when Ferrara was killed and I mean, he had the fantastic scene in For Your Eyes Only where he kicks Locke off the, the cliff that I talked about in the previous episode but Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it feels like it has some, some real weight. Through his interactions with Octopussy and what he's been able to overhear from Kamal and Olaf talking while he was spying on them, Bond realises that he needs to head to East Germany to go to the Octopussy Circus to find out what the next move in the story is. It's there that he finds out that Kamal Khan and Olaf have teamed up to set a nuclear bomb off at an American airbase where Octopussy Circus is performing. This explosion would lead to the West agreeing to have total disarmament and stripping back all of their nuclear weapons after everyone would incorrectly reach the assumption that it was an American warhead that had gone off by accident killing innocent people. It would also then provide Kamal Khan and General Orlov the cover that they need to smuggle the diamonds and the jewels, replace them with the fakes that have been made um, and make a, make a load of money as well. It would also then mean that Russia would have the monopoly on the, the nuclear arms race across Europe and the Allied Nations as well. 
Bond learns that there's a bomb um, and then madly rushes to try and get to the circus. And again, this is another bone of sort of contention for a lot of Bond fans. Whilst evading the armed forces and the police trying to get into the base, Bond dresses up as a clown to describe himself. Now, a lot of people say that this is really silly and really takes you out of the moment. And whilst I can see where you're coming from, I've always found this scene to be really tense because unlike the, the jungle scene before where Bond's swinging away, pretending to be Tarzan and, you know, jumping and having silly reactions to, you know, massive great tigers in the bloody woods or whatever, he plays this really seriously and again the John Barry music and the direction from John Glenn really brings this all together and he's only dressed up as a clown because he desperately needs to evade everybody because he wouldn't get near the generals that he needs to tell there's a bomb in there if if he didn't use some sort of a disguise so I, I really do think, you know, like in the scene where he rips the wig off and takes the nose off and his face is all made up and he's disarming the bomb absolutely fantastic stuff for my money i do like to say understand why some people don't like it but i've never thought it to be cheesy and out of place in the movie i actually thought it was really quite tense and and added something to it so realizing that olaf's been up to no good general gogol's been hot on his trail and realizes that the jewels have been stolen and replaced by fakes after there's a stock check down in the kremlin for for want of a better expression he, of course, then heads to East Berlin and sees Orlov trying to escape. Orlov is shot by a soldier after he tries to run through the border without going through the relevant checks. Orlov's dying words to Gogol are that he'll be remembered as a hero of the Soviet Union. Gogol is then able to recover the jewels. Bond pursues Kamal Khan back to India, who'd managed to escape with Gobinda. He's kidnapped Octopussy as well. Octopussy Circus with James Bond and Q manage to break into Kamal's palace um, and take over but Kamal and Octopussy have been bundled into a plane um, and are flying away. Bond manages to jump on top of the plane and hangs on for dear life as Gabinda and Kamal Khan try to shake him free. Bond manages to get in the plane and of course takes care of both Kamal Khan and Gabinda and manages to safely get off the plane uh, with, with Octopussy. There's then a little epilogue scene where M, Minister of Defence, and General Gogol are all sat in London, basically saying that they're all going to deny the event ever happened, but if Bond can return the, the remaining jewels that Octopus he has, uh, then that will be absolutely fantastic. We then get the usual sort of Roger Moore type ending where he's in bed with his leading lady and there's some sort of gimmick. In this one, we're supposed to believe for all of a split second that he's broken his arm and his leg in the plane crash uh, from the scene previous where he was rescuing Octopussy. Um, and then obviously pulls himself out of his casts and uh, you know has a, has a bit of fun with Octopussy as the, the titles and the, the end credits theme comes up. So what did I think of this film? Like I say, I'm a huge fan of this film. I really, really enjoy it. And you can probably tell that by the fact that I've spent nearly half an hour talking about it. I think that Roger Moore is great again as James Bond. Now, this one should have been his swan song. I mean, realistically, the last one probably should have been his swan song, or the one before that. But this one really should have been the last one. He, he is not fit for the part in A View to a Kill at all. Um, and... You know, again, we'll come to that next time. But he, he just about gets away with it here for my money. I think it's brilliant that Maud Adams is given another shot as a, as a Bond lady. She was absolutely fantastic as Miss Anders in her brief role in A Man With A Golden Gun. And she really, really shines here as Octopussy. Um, and I think it's better as well that they've taken an age-appropriate actress for Roger Moore to be a leading lady. Obviously, Roger Moore was in his late 40s, uh, possibly about sort of 50-ish maybe when this one came out in fact he'll have been early 50s because he was plodding on for 60 when view to a kill came out so he'll have been early to mid mid 50s um and then maud adams i would would have hazarded a guess would probably have been around sort of early 40s so somewhat more age appropriate of a, of a leading lady for james bond and the pair of them have impeccable chemistry they really really do gel well together um I think that Magda's a really great sort of secondary lady as well in the film uh, and her character is sort of really slippery and you don't know quite where her allegiance is right until the third act and I think that's really good. I do like the villains. Now the villains in this one suffer from that sort of living daylights, quantum of solace, tomorrow never dies sort of syndrome where they're a little bit forgettable because they're largely realistic in the sense of you know, you could have uh, an Afghan smuggler and you could have a corrupt, you know, 
army man sort of working with said smuggler to steal you know state jewels and, and mecha mecha mint off them it, it it's all within the realm of possibility isn't it and i think that's where these villains sort of fall into that bit of a category gabinda and the the two knife throwing twins mishka and grishka are, are brilliant henchmen as well they get some really good scenes in it uh, and again all the mi6 regulars um it's money penny um you know again played by the, the the fantastic lois maxwell desmond llewellyn's q and again the introductory performance uh of robert brown playing m all fantastic uh, and i've mentioned it a few times and i've not really talked music much in these um the, you know these reviews that i've been doing but john barry's music really does make james bond and in the the films where he's not there you can really tell um you know and that there's there's only been a couple of composers that have been able to live up to john barry you know michael Kamen and i think david arnold but you know i, I wasn't overly mad on the bill conti stuff um in parts i'm not bothered for marvin hamlish's work um, you know, on the spy who loved me and that sort of thing. So I really do think that John Barry adds a load to it. John Glenn directed this one as well, as like I say, he did with all the eighties ones, and he'd served as the series editor and second unit director up to that point. So he'd been involved with most of the Bond films since the the film series inception in the early sixties. And it's a really, really strong choice to have him as a director because he knows the series and the elements and what makes it tick inside out. And I think that's one of the many reasons that they were able to sort of make these films so regularly like clockwork in the 80s is because they had a really streamlined well-oiled machine that you know just sort of headed up by John Glenn and um, you know obviously the the Broccoli's and the Wilson family producing it you know making these films and I just think it was a really really well sort of like I said well-oiled machine a great little team really really enjoyed this film and I, I do rate it over never say never again i think it was a great decision on sir roger's part to stay on uh, and go head to head with never say never again with you know obviously the sean connery story i don't mind never say never again but obviously i prefer thunderball and the things that work in never say never again um are the things that worked in thunderball you know that the story points and sean connery and things like that but the the things that make that lack uh, you know, like the, the classic Bond elements, the score, the titles, the gun barrel sequence, you know, the characters being played, you know, sort of off-brand versions of themselves because they can't have a Desmond Llewellyn Q type and they can't have a, you know, a Bernard Lee M type and all that sort of thing. And it, it just, you know, it, it feels like an imitation, feels like a bootleg, doesn't it? Does never say never again. And I think that's the reason that this one succeeded is not only is it a superior film, but it's got all the elements that you know and expect and actually just goes to show that, that one man alone can't, hold this franchise on on the shoulders it is the sum of the parts um but there you go i love this film and i would give it a 7.5 out of 10 so thank you very much for watching folks that has been my thoughts my recapping my review um, my debriefing if you will um, of Octopussy from 1983 next time we'll take a look at A View to a Kill, I am going to cover Never Say Never Again but I intend to get through the official franchise and No Time to Die first if there's time and then come back and look at the unofficial episodes as sort of a, an epilogue an encore if you will to this series but the plan is to get through all the official ones up to No Time to Die if you've liked this video please think about subscribing to the channel I would love to keep you around, I do talk about the James Bond films uh, I generally try and have these videos out every every two weeks but I do put a video out at least once a week if not twice where I can talking about collecting physical media as you can see here quite a collection behind me and over there too uh, I talk about uh, you know my favorite films I do film reviews I do unboxings I do collection updates I talk about pretty much anything to do with my love for physical media and movies now if that sounds like your cup of tea please subscribe to this channel ring that notification bell if you do and then that way you're the first person to be notified whenever I do post a video leave me your thoughts down below in the comments and don't forget to drop a thumbs up on the video if you've liked it and above all else folks take care and I look forward to seeing you next time in this series when we look at a view to a kill cheers <laughs>